Bring to order, please. Everybody grab a seat. Okay, Doug, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Alvarado? Yes. Commissioner Burke? Yes. Commissioner Dunn? Present. Commissioner Arp? Here. Commissioner Gilmetti? Present. Commissioner Gordino? Present. Commissioner Kehoe? Here. Commissioner Tavaloni? Here. Commissioner Madaffer? Here. Commissioner Van Kenneidenberg? Here. Chair Inman? Here. Senator Bell? Assemblymember Frazier? Here. Madam Chair, we have a quorum. Thank you. I'm going to, first thing out of the gate, ask everybody to rise. And we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance today. And I'd like to do that in honor of our late president, who's being buried today, George H.W. Bush. So join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we'll take a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Okay, so we will now go to welcome to the region and mayor. Yeah, we took that. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair Inman, Executive Director Branson, Commissioners, Assembly Member Frazier, very nice to have you here, and Secretary Annas. Thank you all for being here in Riverside County. Chairman Reed sends his regrets and his regards. He was called away to business in San Diego, so he won't be able to join us today. But I'd like to give you a brief update on the uh, Riverside County Express Lane Network. I thought that since a year ago, many of you were here joining us for our groundbreaking on that exciting project. A year has gone by, we've got some updated news. So we thought today would be a good time to share that information. But before we do, we also had another board member from RCTC who was not able to be here today, but he wanted to say hello. So if you could join me for a video just here in a minute. Put the video up. We do have a video. It's coming up. Okay. Well, he's not normally silent like this. So we'll need to reboot that. And we'll try again because uh, Supervisor John Tavaloni is never that. Be a wonderful celebration for our community and the holiday season. This is somewhat of a bittersweet time for me because after 24 years as a county supervisor and member of RCTC, this is my last month in office. So I want to express my appreciation, my sincere appreciation to you, the entire commission, for the work you've done in partnership with me and my colleagues on the Riverside County Transportation Commission over the last two decades. Together, we piloted innovative programs such as the design build pro projects and tolling, of course, and of course, participated in the road charge study. We've also delivered transformational projects such as the 91 HOV lane project and the 6215 interchange, both just across the street from this building. And of course, there's a the Paris Valley Line Metrolink extension the widening of the 215, and more recently, the innovative CV Link project in the Coachella Valley, which is the state's largest active transportation project. I'm confident the commission will continue your strong partnership with Riverside County. Surely long after I'm out of office, this county truly is the best heart of California's future, but mostly because a man we all look up to, my Uncle Joe, who you also call Uncle Joe, will be sitting on this dais with you far into the future. Even though he's 95 today, we know he will be there and won't let you forget us. I hope you have a great meeting here today and I wish you the very best of the holiday seasons. Thank you very much. 
so it certainly has been an honor and a privilege to work for Supervisor Tavaloni and his colleagues, Supervisor Marion Ashley, for all of these years. So their retirements will certainly be felt here in Riverside County, but they've sent, set a great foundation for us, and under their, uh, the leadership that they've exhibited over the years, we will continue marching forward. There was, and if you guys could put the PowerPoint up, that would be great. So you all know uh, in uh, early uh, 2003, Orange County Transportation Authority purchased the 91 express lanes and turned it back over to public ownership. And that really gave us the ability to take that, uh, that important corridor project and turn it into something that was of value to Riverside County as well. Okay, can you guys advance the, yeah, I'm trying. Sorry, I apologize for the technical difficulties. We'll see how many people have to come and help. There we go, no. Okay, so as you all know that the 91 express lanes in Orange County allowed us to move forward with the 91 express lanes in Riverside County, a $1.4 billion project that opened in 2017. You can see here the limits of the project. Or not, okay. Um, in 2017, we opened that corridor. We immediately rolled into the construction of the I-15 project that is under construction and will be open to the traveling public in 2020. We're following that with the I-15 South extension. $50 million in STIP funding was set aside for that project. And the day after the election, when Prop 6 was defeated, we had a request for qualifications out on the street by 9 o'clock in the morning to get that project going as well. We have the 1591 project that's an express lane connector, SB 132 funds were set aside for that. And we have the 7191 interchange project, which allows connection between Orange County, Riverside County, Los Angeles, as well as San Bernardino County. The 91 express lanes, again, have been in operation. We had our first full year, and you can see the I-15 project there, the I-15 South extension. I'm not sure who's, are you, can you keep going? There we go. Can you, if you can just keep moving through the slides till you get to a graphic here. Thank you, right there. <coughs> So the 91 express lanes have been in operation for a full year. Receipts over the first year were nearly $48 million. Now most of that revenue is going towards operations and maintenance as well as debt service. It is a, a the ridership on the corridor, we're seeing 14 and a half million annual customers using the express lanes. Over 60% of those customers are also using the Orange County express lanes. 3.2 million of those customers are HOV3, or at least they say they are HOV3, uh, using the express lanes. And that really looks, we're looking at 40,000 vehicles a day are using the express lanes in Riverside County. So we've seen a, a boom year, that's for sure. But what's really important about that is that this network will continue to serve not only the commuters in the Inland Empire, impacting their quality of life, reducing congestion, but it's also part of a broader Southern California network. If you could move to the next slide, please. It does it work now? There we go. So you can see here, the projects that I've been talking about today are part of the lar larger Southern California network. And as we know in Southern California, every day is a freight day. You can see <laughs> the port of Los Angeles, the port of Long Beach, there to the left of the screen, you can see how the express lane network that we're constructing here in Riverside County, as well as corridors that we're considering constructing as express lanes are really an important part of that network to move the goods in and out of the ports of LA and Long Beach through the Inland Empire. Our partners to the north in San Bernardino County are also expanding their express lane network. So this is more than just about express lanes and what they can do for commuters as well as express bus service, et cetera. It's also about moving freight in and out of our corridor. Now this is a daunting challenge and one that's been facing not only Southern California, but the state of California for a long time. And it really takes an awful lot of money in order to be able to make this work. This pie chart here shows the $2 billion, the breakdown of the $2 billion in investments Riverside County has already made in our express lane network. 
The $2 billion, as you can see, is primarily local funding sources as well as a TIFI loan. We've had some federal formula dollars in the state share. A relatively minor amount was Prop 1B state and local partnership formula dollars. When we were moving these projects forward, the state didn't have the cash at hand, so we're delighted and thrilled that SB1 is here to stay, and we'll be looking forward to partnership in the future to continue expanding the express lanes. We're very proud of our relationship that we have with the CTC as well as with Caltrans. District 8 is a phenomenal partner here in the region in helping us to get innovative and exciting projects delivered to the taxpayers who deserve uh, to, who deserve a congestion-free drive or as much as possible on their commutes each day. So thank you very much for being here in Riverside. I hope you enjoy your stay. It's the beautiful Festival of Lights. We do bring in on the weekend, we've got special Metrolink trains that bring in thousands of people from Orange and LA counties as well as other parts of Riverside County to downtown Riverside. This Friday, as a part of the SCAG Go Human program, they'll be hosting Illuminate Riverside, Illuminate Riverside, which will have a lighted walkway from the downtown Joseph Tavoloni Metrolink station all the way to downtown Riverside. So it'll be an illuminated uh, walkway with some uh, pedestrian safety features as well to highlight the importance of safe pedestrian access. So thank you for coming to Riverside County. I hope you have a terrific meeting and we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you. Thanks. We have any questions of Ann? Yes, Commissioner Gometti. And thank you for that great presentation. You guys are doing a great job down here. I have one question on the 91 Express. You mentioned the revenues was about $48 million. Yes. How does that equate to the cost of, of construction for that project? The cost of the overall project cost was $1.4 billion. We borrowed just over a billion dollars. 421 million of that was a TIFI loan. So for the $48 million that we brought in in revenue, approx and I'm just looking at last year because every year is slightly different, approximately 18 million or so of that on an average year would be spent towards operations and maintenance and another 18 to 20 million on paying back our debt. In the early years, we're only paying back interest and setting up reserve accounts. We don't start paying principal until 2030, and at that time, our debt service will jump up oh, closer to $30 million a year. So, so roughly 85 to 90% of our revenues coming in will be going back out the door for debt service and, as well as operations and maintenance. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How far is that walk? I would say it might be a little over a mile. It's not as the crow flies, so you, it's a little over a mile, I think. Did you want to do that on Friday night? Well, I was asking questions. I, I, I said two, three, four, maybe four blocks. It's, it's a little bit farther than that, only because you have, you have to go a little bit around the way. I'll get it the exact. It's, it's a mile or less, Joe. <laughs> okay. It's about a mile or less. Okay. So, so Anne, to our good friend, Supervisor Tavoloni, we too want to thank him for his commitment and dedication. And just a little hint, he's a little late with Papa Joe's birthday, so... According to our records, that's kind of in July. It's, it's so. in July. I think he was trying to say he's 95 today. Doesn't mean it was his birthday today. Oh, well, we thought he was a little late with that birthday no, card. No, I think he remembers that because their <laughs> birthdays are only a couple days apart. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. But anyway, right. hats off to our senior commissioner and to Supervisor Tabaloni. So thank, thank you. you. All right, we will move on now to item number three. Terry. Good afternoon, commissioners. Item number three was originally scheduled as a hearing for resolution of necessity. However, the property owner sent a letter to the commission dated November 21st, 2018, and I believe that's um, included in your packet. Um, and in that letter, he waived his right for an appearance. So with that, staff recommends approval of this resolution of necessity. Okay. I have lots of motions. So, uh, motion by Gilmetti, a second. I heard by uh, Medaffer. Is there any discussion? 
Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That motion carries. Thank you. Item number four, approval of minutes. We have a motion by Commissioner Van Kenneinenberg, a second by Commissioner Tavaloni. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That motion carries. Item number five, approval of minutes for our joint commission meetings with the state of Washington and Oregon. We have a motion by Commissioner Tavaloni, a second by Commissioner Burke, or, or was it Kehoe down there? Burke, okay. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That motion carries. Item number six, commissioner's compensation. We have a motion by Commissioner Tavaloni, a second by Commissioner Dunn. Discussion on these items? All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That motion carries. Uh, Executive Director Branson report. Uh, commissioners, I have a little bit longer report than normal today, a lot to share out with you all. I um, wanted to just um, thank, start out by thanking Caltrans for this morning's project delivery workshop, for their um, willingness to meet with us and just have open dialogue on how project delivery is um, taking place at Caltrans, and we look forward to future a workshop similar to this, and we will plan for another workshop in January. Yesterday, the Commission did hold its second joint meeting with the California Air Resources Board. The meeting was held at LA Metro's facilities, and again, we just want to thank LA Metro for allowing for us to use their great meeting room. At that meeting, ARB staff did uh, share with us, the Commission, their statutorily required progress report on how the MPOs are achieving regional greenhouse gas emission reduction targets. And Caltrans also reported on their project progress. Uh, the, again, the, the Air Resources Board progress report was prepared by the California Air Resources Board, and it was presented only as an information item. Lastly, uh, several MPOs at the meeting, um, several MPO representatives did give presentations on the costs and the multiple requirements that must be addressed during the RTP development process. They spoke about the advancements that have been achieved to reduce these emissions and the tremendous hurdles that must be overcome to achieve further reductions. A common thread reported by all the MPOs was their concern about California's housing crisis and the role this crisis has on efforts to address VMT reductions. Commission staff looks forward to working with ARB staff as we prepare for our next two, uh, the next two upcoming joint meetings in 2019. And those meetings are posted on the meeting calendar that I'll be bringing forward um, for your approval under my item. So um, also wanted to just uh, let you know that the Road Charge Technical Advisory Committee did meet on November 16th in Sacramento. At that time, the Road Charge Technical Advis Advisory Committee did approve recommendations. Those recommendations are included in the draft annual report that is under my report for your approval today. Um, at that meeting, we also discussed uh, 2019 areas for study. Uh, and one of the focus areas that the Road Charge Technical Advisory Committee wants to work on in 2019 is focusing on the efforts that Caltrans and other states are currently undergoing on with regard to road charge with respect to privacy, data security, and other matters. And we also did discuss um, arranging a technical advisory committee that would coincide with a commission meeting during 2019 so that you would have an ability to meet and, and um, hear a little bit what this committee's been working on. And just on that note, the technical advisory committee members have been meeting for some time now. And we really, um, I really, from my perspective, see that they've really dedicated a lot of time and energy to this. It's very much appreciated. Also wanted to recognize Brady Tactile of Caltrans, who received the 2018 Best of California Award for Demonstrated Excellence in Project Management relative to his work as a project manager for the Road Charge Pilot Program. That pilot came in a million dollars under its budget, 
and the team delivered its final report six months in advance of the legislative deadline. And I just know that, you know, the Road Charge Technical Advisory Committee had a key role in that pilot program, but um, Brady should be recognized, and he's really helped us a lot with that committee. Also in my report, I wanted to um, let you know that later on this agenda, we have a presentation from Bosch on an electric bike, um, electric bike program. But um, together in partnership, Bosch and Cal Bike are here today, and they have actually brought uh, electric bikes uh, for your um, for your ability to go out and experience what it's like to ride on an electric bike. So I wanted to let everybody know about that. It's right outside the door, if any of you have any interest. And just want to thank um, both Bosch and, and Calbike for doing that for us today. As a staffing update, I uh, wanted to let you all know that we have appointed a Deputy Director for Legislation and Finance. His name, uh, the individual we hired, his name is Paul Gulozuski. He's currently, uh, he's, he's been employed at the Legislative Analyst Office for the past 11 years, where he's been responsible for advising on fiscal and policy issues in various program areas, including the Office of Criminal Justice, Education, and the Transportation Sections of the LAO. Most recently, he published a primer on California's transportation system, an overview report summarizing Senate Bill 1, a legislative required report on vehicle insurance cost increases at Caltrans, and he authored the analysis of Proposition 6 for the Official State Voter Guide. Paul does hold a Master's of Public Policy degree from Duke University, and we are um, pleased to have made this appointment, and he will begin on December 10th. We've also hired um, Two of our student assistants, um, as uh, staff services manage, manage, anal, management analysts in our office. And one of the first hire was Megan Petrancelli, who's a graduate of St. Mary's College of California with a Bachelor of Science in Biology and a minor in Chemistry. She's received a post baccalaureate degree from California State University Sacramento in Speech Pathology and Audiology. She's currently pursuing a master's degree at, at Sac CSU Sacramento in Communication Sciences and Disorders. She has worked as a speech therapy assistant. She has, in our office, worked very, very hard. She's very experienced. We are tremendously pleased to have made this appointment. She's helped us in a, in a very um, large extent on our active transportation program. We've also hired Alika Shigazi, yeah, she's a 2014 graduate from University of California, Davis. She has a Bachelor's of Science in Textiles with an emphasis in Marketing and Economics. And um, she has been really working hard on the uh, Local Streets and Roads program as well as the Active Transportation program, and she will be assigned to assist Alicia with regards to the Local Streets and Roads program. I wanted to announce that Richard Estrada the senior engineer that's been on loan from Caltrans will be returning to District 11. We really appreciate Richard. He's been a true asset to our office. I don't see, I see him here. Um, and Richard, thank you for everything, and we hate to see you go back to Caltrans. So thank you for, uh, and then Lori, and lastly, Laura Pennybaker. Just wanted to recognize her today on the agenda is the adoption of the Comprehensive Multimodal Corridor Plan Guidelines. And she's um, just done a wonderful job and she's worked really hard. As well as that leads me to the action items on my report. A staff has provided you with the text of the Commission's 2018 Annual Report to the Legislature. The report details the Commission's accomplishments during the past fiscal year and outlines the Commission's annual recommendations to the Legislature for the upcoming year. Staff recommends your approval of the report text in your handout today. May I, Madam Chair, make a comment? Yeah, let me just record the motion. So we have a motion by Commissioner Van Kanijenberg, a second by Commissioner Dunn. Open to discussion, Commissioner Kehoe. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, uh, Susan, for the the uh, update. Uh, and I'm glad you highlighted our uh, joint meeting yesterday with the Air Resources Board. Um, I think all of us know how important the issue is, and uh, we got a chance to hear, uh, you know, very good presentations on. Our, um, our climate change goals and greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And uh, one thing that occurred to me is I think uh, 
the CTC, we commissioners should consider uh, maybe organizing a workshop to look at uh, how we can highlight and expand the work that we're already doing to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the transportation sector. We have a great story to tell, and uh, I think we just need to uh, figure out how we want to focus on that. So maybe we could uh, ask staff to come back with some recommendations for a workshop uh, in come back at the January meeting with a little plan of how we can start developing these themes. Thank you. Commissioner Medaffer. <coughs> Just the right one? Oh, it is the right one. Uh, totally support that, by the way. I think uh, it'd be a great idea. There is a lot of things that we've done, and clearly SB1 funding helps in that regard substantially. The one thing I wanted to comment on was just to expand briefly to my colleagues a uh, comment made by Director Branson regarding the road charge technical advisory committee. As many of you know, we pretty much stayed fairly quiet during the SB1 debate uh, with Prop 6 uh, on the ballot. But the opportunity that comes forward now, as we even saw yesterday in CARB's report, is that everybody is recognizing that the gas tax revenue, while good right now, long term, is not boding well for funding for transportation in the state of California, or frankly, the whole country. Uh, and I just wanted to mention and suggest to our chair that we probably, within the first or second quarter of 2019, I would like the commissioners to have the opportunity, maybe we should do it like we did that project delivery committee meeting one time where we had the tables right here, and you get a chance to meet face to face the members of this road charge technical advisory committee, which as you know, Senate Bill 1077 sunsets in a couple of weeks, but as you also know, thanks to Chairman Fraser, uh, the uh, road charge process starts, uh, continues for another five years as California leads really the rest of the country in figuring out a way to replace the now antiquated gasoline tax. And so it might be a good idea like we did with Project Delivery earlier today uh, to where commissioners can meet the privacy rights people, uh, the folks that are very concerned about information sharing, the technocrats, the people that are actually been part of this effort uh, that have been unsung heroes for now, how many years we've been meeting since, tw since 2015. And they've just done a fantastic job. So I just wanted to mention that to you, Madam Chair, and hope that we could bring them back at a future meeting. I would agree, and just to build on that, you know, who knows when we may see a federal infrastructure bill, but I would hope that we're prepared so that California hasn't been the pioneers, and then what the feds do is give money to catch up to where we are. So let's make sure that we have a unified ask on what our next step of learning on this journey would be, so I, I, I would agree with that. Can, can I just add also to Secretary Annis, great work of Kerry Borvahiti and Brady, Tactile over at Caltrans. They've been fantastic partners, and it was great to see that, I mean, the only Caltrans person that got that honor that I recall was Brady, uh, and I think that just is a testament to the hard work that they're doing to find the future for transportation funding in the state of California. Great. Chairman Frazier, did you wish to say something? Thank you, Madam Chair. Based on yesterday's meeting, I just wanted to acknowledge ongoing uh, projects that this commission will be funding through uh, SB1 and the acknowledgement that the, the gains that they will make through the ATP, which is about $220 million a year, the $700 million a year that will go out in public transit, and the congested corridors programs also that will be funded through this commission of the good work that it's doing to reduce the impact on GHG. Uh, going forward. So I think we need to highlight that and let other agencies know that this is a, a, the good work that this commission is doing in a respectful way to the environment. Any further discussion? So my question of you, Director Branson, do we need to amend our motion to include uh, Commissioner Kehoe's, I almost called her Senator Kehoe, uh, recommendation, or is that just an uh, item that you can work on? Commissioners, what I would recommend um, is that I, I've heard direction today to, um, as staff, develop a, a plan to bring back to you in January on how we would um, highlight the successes in uh, that we've made collectively with all of our partners in um, the world of reducing greenhouse gas in the transportation sector at a high level, but with a focus on developing policy 
advice in our role for the legislature and so we can put together a staff report and bring that back in January for your consideration on whether or not you want us to embark on those type of workshops. Does that sound? So we're covered, yes. Can Commissioner Gomedic. Can we make sure that we have a discussion on land use because it's, it's tied into housing and transit and everything else. So I, I, I would be uh, um, concerned that we don't include that. I would, I would sincerely like us to include that in the discussion. Well, and, and I want to add my thanks to the MPOs and the public, everybody who participated yesterday. We had a very uh, lengthy discussion, a vibrant and, and good discussion, I think. And so I think that there's lots of material there. So let's make sure that, uh, so if, if we're covered and, and you don't need any other formal discussion, we'll just vote on the... Yeah, I think, um, yeah, but, uh, we'll get back to the vote, but I think um, what we will want to do is is talk with our partners a little bit, um, some of the key partners out there, and, and put together a plan for you that would include land use, housing. We need to cover, address the economy, economic development, and a, a lot of different factors so that we can develop good comprehensive policy recommendations to reduce greenhouse gas in this sector. So we'll um, just... Um, just okay, once again, I'm looking out at all of you. Greatly appreciate your partnership with us in that regard. So we'll bring something back to you. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Yes. And uh, no, we have one on the annual report. So uh, all in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That motion carries. One more action. Okay. Director Branson. Okay, commissioners, there's one more action before you. It is to approve the updated 2019 meeting calendar uh, that is in your agenda packet. What I um, want to add to that is a potential for, I want to add a project delivery workshop on January 29th. Um, we will add that to our calendar, but we will work with Caltrans and your schedules to see if that date works. But I'd like to add that. So with that amendment to the agenda calendar, or the calendar before you, I seek your approval. I need a motion. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Von Kanienberg, a second by Commissioner Kehoe. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That motion carries. Uh, we'll move on to item number eight, Commissioner reports. Yes, Commissioner Alvarado. Um, I usually wait till the end of the meeting to wish everybody a Merry Christmas, but uh, thanks to uh, Senator Bell and Assemblymember <laughs> Frazier. Um, it's going to be a very Merry Christmas for the transportation community this year and for many years to come. Um, acknowledging that, uh, I remember when Prop 1B passed and we were all here um, probably showing our age, Commissioner Gilmetti and, and Tavaloni and I. Um, but it was almost a spectacle. Um, you know, we, we were very successful in, in getting 1B passed. And then the fight over the money was almost in, embarrassing. So we're starting again anew. Uh, number one, I want to thank everybody in the room uh, for their help, whatever and however they get, they did it uh, to get uh, the proposition, Proposition 6 defeated. But now that we have a steady funding source, we need to remember those lessons from, from Prop 1B. You know, there's a, I don't know if it's a law or, or just a gentleman's agreement, but there's a 60-40 split uh, between the North and the South. Um, we're gonna have to be cognizant of that. There's, um, you know, going to be another little split between urban and rural, and we need to be conscious of that. Um, you know, it's a, and sophisticated and somewhat unsophisticated staffs. So we all need to understand that um, the first go-round or the second go-round, maybe even a third go-round, may not go quite the way that everybody wanted it to. But with a, with a steady funding source, we can, we can get those projects um, in the queue. We don't have to worry about, about not getting your fair share over the next 
five or ten or however many years when we're no longer here. Because I think when we, and we showed it uh, during this election process, that if we're all in this together, we can be very, very successful. It's when we become petty and, and a little bit greedy, if I, if I may be so, um, so uh, free with the word, is when we look bad in front of the public. So we just want to, I want to caution everybody. I mean, you know, we all worked hard. Uh, we all wrote big checks uh, to get this, this thing through. This was a legacy vote. And let's not, let's not embarrass that legacy uh, with inter, with the inter-family fight over how the money's going to be spent. I just kind of wanted to, you know, just to say that because, um, I mean, you can't believe how pleased I am that that we're sitting up here looking at finally um, do a lot of hard work from the legislature, a steady funding source uh, that we can count on for years to come. Thank you. I think Commissioner Alvarado just told the kids to behave, right? <laughs> Million six. <laughs> anyway, thank you, Commissioner. Anybody else? I would like to report that Director Branson and I had the opportunity to tour CRNR Environmental Services in Paris, California, and we were two absolutely amazed folks uh, watching their anaerobic digester uh, that turns the green waste into renewable natural gas. So it was absolutely uh, amazing. The, this project was funded partially by the organization, the business, and also uh, the Energy Commission. And I believe CARV may have put some money in our South Coast Air District, but it was absolutely fascinating. Uh, Susan and I were delighted when they said nobody to ask so many questions as we asked, because we really had no clue. Um, but it was fascinating, and, and I would suggest that perhaps when we come again, it would be a great thing uh, for the commission to tour because we were really, really impressed with the creativity and the solution, and it really is uh, some of the work that was referenced earlier, what we are doing, what our partners are doing, and clearly our trash haulers go right into our neighborhood. So as green as we can get that fleet, it'll be fantastic. So. That's all I have on that item. So if there are no more commission reports, we'll move on to Secretary Annis. Sure, good afternoon. Just wanted to uh, mention two things uh, for my report. First of all, I wanted to recognize all the uh, hard and dedicated work that uh, agency departments have done in the recent fires, uh, the Camp Fire and the fires in uh, Malibu and in that area. Um, and many employees have lost their homes in these fires, and it's just it really amazing uh, the dedication where people, again, that have especially lost their homes uh, are coming to work and uh, managing contracts and doing work themselves to clear those roadways where guardrails have, have burned, where signs have burned, uh, clearing the roads for emergency first responders, uh, manning uh, roadblocks and, and the highway patrols also involved in this work heavily with uh, at times several hundred uh, officers out in the field to uh, manage the uh, the road closures and uh, work with the communities on the recovery. So that's, that's uh, truly amazing work. Uh, the other topic I wanted to cover was really to, uh, it, and it builds on what uh, Commissioner Alvarado uh, mentioned with uh, uh, a bit of a reflection on where we are today and you know, the other dynamic of this meeting is it's the last CTC meeting within the Governor Brown administration. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's a, a chance there, I think, to look back a bit on all the accomplishments, not only of the commission, but of commission staff. And really the uh, uh, much, much hard and effective work over eight years, in, in my view, and many of you have been here for most of that eight years. And uh, clearly uh, we started with things like increased oversight, increased accountability, 
Uh, legislation required that of the CTC to be more engaged with Caltrans and project oversight, and uh, you've done a great job in that area, I think both staff and commissioners, and I think that's been, that was very much a faith-building exercise uh, to the public. Uh, of course, implemented new programs from the active transportation program to some of the cap and trade transit programs. And uh, of course, recently with Senate Bill 1, I think in a record time implemented multiple new programs, uh, designated projects. Uh, it's truly amazing. And, and as Commissioner Alvarado said, it's really a, a generational type uh, funding program we've put together. So. Again, just want to want to close with a recognition of the great success of the CTC over this uh, Governor Brown administration. That, of course, covers everyone, whether you're a Governor Brown appointment, a legislative appointment, or an ex officio legislator. Legislator, it's been a very productive uh, uh, eight years for the commission. So, I want to invite the crowd maybe to join me in a round of applause for the commission. Thank you, Brian, and I, I, I want to go back to yesterday just one more time in the thank you category and thank our tremendous staff, and we're small, but we're pretty mighty, so in particular, I want to call out Doug and Garth, and I think Laura uh, played a key role, and if anybody else, I, I don't mean to only pick three, everybody helped, everybody pitches in, that's how we function. But you guys do an amazing job, so it doesn't go without notice. So the category of thank you. So may, may I just add a yes, Commissioner? To uh, to Brian, uh, um, I want to acknowledge the great work that uh, Caltrans and the agency has done with the CTC, uh, and this administration has been so forward thinking. Uh, that it's uh, given, I think, the CTC an opportunity uh, to do very progressive things from San Diego to the Oregon border, uh, things that we can all be proud of. Um, and so uh, the feeling is entirely mutual, at least from my, on my behalf. So thank you for all your work. All righty. We will move on now to the Caltrans. And I think Stephen Keck is going to pinch it for Lori today. I will. Thank you very much, uh, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, Stephen Keck, I am the Deputy Director for Finance for Caltrans. Um, Director Berman was not able to travel to be with us, uh, excuse me, with us this week, so I'll be doing my best to represent uh, her. I do have quite a bit to relay today in terms of Director's talking points, um, but before I do start, I'd like to thank uh, Director Branson and Commissioner Medaffer for their kind words. Uh, uh, Brady and Carrie both happen to work in finance and uh, I'm very proud of them as well. So thank you both for recognizing them. Um, I have several staff changes to talk about at the executive level at Caltrans. Um, first, as you may recall, we have a vacancy or had a vacancy in the division of maintenance when Tony Tavares took the uh, district director and district four job. And I'm very pleased to announce that Dennis Agar has accepted the position of chief of the division of maintenance. Of course, we know uh, Dennis is the District 10 director. Um, what I didn't know and would not have believed is that Dennis has 29 years of service with Caltrans, um, both in headquarters and in the districts in a variety of, of management roles. Um, as he trans transitions back to headquarters, Dan McElhaney will be uh, taking up the acting role as District Director in District 10. Uh, Dan McElhaney uh, is the um, Assistant Director of District 4 now. Um, and he'll be moving over um, during this transition time. I'd also like to thank Amr Bada for uh, filling in as the acting chief of the Division of Maintenance during this recruitment process. Uh, second, uh, the department's division chief for um, business operations, uh, Marianne Mitchell, retired in November, uh, and we've already appointed her replacement. Uh, Shannon Simulai is the new chief for the Division of Business Operations. Uh, she comes to Caltrans uh, for the first time, but has 25 years of experience with the state, uh, most recently at the Water Control Board, where she was uh, chief of their um, uh, business operations, where she uh, managed 32 individual facilities for them. Um, and finally, I would like to announce the appointment of Gilbert Petrosans to the, the chief of the Division of Accounting. He fills in behind Clark, who I appointed to the Division of Budgets. 
Uh, Gilbert has an, also 25 years of experience in Caltrans accounting, um, and uh, uh, I think he'll do very well there. I'm very, since he works for me, I'm very pleased to have him there. Um, I'd also like to thank Nancy Kataoka for filling in in that division chief role uh, while we were going through recruitment. So we welcome Gilbert, Shannon, Dennis, and Dan to their new assignments, and I very much look, look forward to working with all of them. Um, as, uh, as Secretary Annis briefly touched on, we're in the midst of a fire season. Uh, isn't that weird to say? It's December. I say midst, even though it's December and it's raining outside, because even though three months ago we were uh, dealing with uh, the car and Mendocino complex fires, here we are again reporting on devastating fires, uh, um, uh, even though we're in December. Um, as my notes. As Brian mentioned, we did have employees involved in these fires. In Paradise, we had 43 uh, employees who were evacuated, and 23 of our Caltrans employees lost their homes in that fire. Uh, and despite that, uh, many of these employees continued to work, as, as Brian mentioned, uh, handling road closures, inspecting bridges, and doing the things that we do to keep the transportation system up and running. They did that while evacuated, and some of them never had a home to go back to. And that, I, I, that's just an amazing story to me, and I, I know uh, Director Berman w would want me to convey how proud we are of our employees for that. Um, as many of you may know, uh, former District 3 District Director Jody Jones was the mayor, is the mayor of Paradise, and even at the national level, you saw some very interesting pictures of her uh, along with President Trump, Governor Brown, and Governor-elect Newsom, all in the same photograph uh, surveying the devastation of the Paradise Fire. Um, so it hits not just our current employees, but our past employees as well. Um, during the uh, Camp and Woolsey fires, we had nine separate route closures in five counties. Uh, we are doing repair work on all of them. Uh, as Brian mentioned, replacing guardrail, felling trees that died that need to be uh, felled for safety reasons, uh, working on drainage repair, traffic control, removing debris from the road. The list is tremendous for what we need to do. Um, on routes 32, 70, 99, and 191, 191 in Butte County and in Plumas County. Uh, the work on Route 191, the emergency work to reopen the route to Paradise has been completed so we can get emergency services and uh, the folks who live there back uh, into the area, uh, that has been completed. Unfortunately, what that means though, with fires, the ground becomes hydroscopic, or hydrophobic rather, it will not absorb future water. So after a fire, we have to deal with slides. So we are out mitigating as much as we can along the fire areas uh, to, to put in controls in the into place to avoid this, but it can't be completely done. Uh, so we'll be keeping an eye on these areas as we enter in earnest the rainy season. Uh, and finally, uh, I would like to share some efforts that Caltrans has been involved in at the global level. Um, the Transportation Decarbonization Alliance uh, we've been involved in, and that was launched in 2017 as part of the World Bank Group and the United Nations, uh, and it's basically to uh, try to come up with means to uh, make transportation carbon net zero, or, or net zero for carbon emissions. Um, in fact, Secretary Annis signed the compact uh, bringing uh, California into this group, and we're the first uh, North American member to be a part of this group, continuing to demonstrate California's leadership in this area on a global level. Um, on the 15th of November, Director Berman attended the conference uh, uh, for the Transport Decarbonization Alliance, uh, where she shared what we're doing in California uh, as a department, as a commission. Uh, she also talked about the the uh, role of the Air Resources Board and High Speed Rail at this, at this meeting. And we also start to learn from others what they're doing to, uh, to bring carbon emissions from transportation down. Um, and with that, I'll end my remarks, and Lori might have more to add on, on her, uh, her visit when she's here at the next meeting. Any questions or comments? We have any questions? Hearing none? Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Okay, we are now going to move on to item number 11, Vince Mamano. Okay, could you have pretty high tech up here? Oh, Vince, I have a special request. 
Could no, you stand, bad. please, so everybody can hear you? <laughs> well, Bobby honestly, put me up to that. that. I, doubt, I doubt that affects your federal funding here in California <laughs> at all. <laughs> I mean, I'm the, listen. You know, I wouldn't say I'm just so you know, I'm a puddle when it comes to my depth. So you're, yeah. And the federal government is closed so, uh, today. So thank you, and I'll be taking our money to Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, today is a, a, a national day of mourning uh, for uh, Bush the senior, uh, President 41. Uh, I had an opportunity to watch some of the. Uh, the funeral and the speakers, and I know there was a the workshop you guys had today. I would encourage you to take to watch that. It was really interesting, and uh, um, it's kind of one of those things that when when it's our day to have that about us, we're kind of hoping people are saying the same things about us. Um, but it was really I, I enjoyed the speakers that that spoke at it, and it was really interesting to me. Um, couple things. Let's uh, run down. So uh, Democrats. Democrats now have the House majority. Uh, Representative DeFazio, uh, I think, is the new TNI chair. And I think you talked earlier about uh, uh, having some infrastructure, uh, major infrastructure legislation. That's some, one of the things he's talked about as one of his priorities in trying to move forward with that. Um, we are currently under a continuing resolution, the federal government is. Uh, ends tomorrow. So when you hear about the government shutdown, that could possibly be tomorrow. Um, and uh, so that's our, we've talked before about our, our authorization. We have MAP, I mean, uh, FAST Act has got us till 2020. That's our authorization. The appropriations is the funding that they give under that FAST Act. And, and our appropriations ends on December 7th. Uh, I've heard everywhere between, you know, another five-day uh, continuing resolution all the way to a full appropriations bill. So it, it could be anywhere. We'll see what happens. Uh, I was trying to do some quick research to see if I've heard any sign, anything signed within the last half an hour or so. I hadn't heard anything. So we'll see what happens with that. Talked about emergency relief. We got $1.5 billion of uh, ER emergency relief federal eligible um, uh, projects that are out there, $1.5 billion worth, and that's not including the most recent fires. I just recently signed a letter about a week and a half ago making the most recent fires all eligible for federal aid dollars. Uh, we haven't heard any word on whether or not Congress will increase that $100 million that we get nationally um, under our program, so I haven't heard anything on that. But uh, but like we've talked about before, these projects are eligible for federal dollars when they become available. But we've just made the most recent um, fires and the mudslides that that are coming with that. I think that's just a it's fantastic work that the Caltrans does and the local uh, agencies do to to try and make everybody as safe as they can and get people in and out as as they can. Um, it would look like you were going to comment on ER. Did you want well, to? Well, I, I was just to trying to clarify. So we have, excluding the most recent Camp and Wolseley fires, we have $1.5 billion in yeah. eligible projects just for the state of California. Correct. And last year, there was $100 million nationally. Nationally, correct. So if we continued, we were lucky because we got a good chunk of that, so to speak. 60 million was my recollection of yeah, what point. we got. But if I do the math, that's a lot of years. It's a lot of years before that cleans up. And people need help now, and we help them now as best we can. So, so what Congress will do periodically, Congress will, in an Appropriations Act, like a, one that's possibly coming, or in the FAST Act, or in the different opportunities that Congress has, they will sometimes add funding to the emergency relief pot to try and get down that backlog of emergency relief. That's a con that's a congressional decision because the hundred million is in the in the in uh, federal law, so it's not a decision that Federal Highway has. That's that's, that's mandated by Congress. Okay. Well, I think as it becomes season when everybody heads to D.C., whether it's a trade organization, Ashto, whatever. Many of us will be back there on a number of different trips. I think we need to make sure that we do what we can to communicate that this would be a good ask. I don't know if there's anyone in the state of California that wouldn't ask uh, to get this 1.5 billion of eligible projects funded. So 
Uh, Director Branson, if we could just put that on our list and as we kind of look at an outreach and communications plan, I think it would be good to have a lot of our partners who go back looking at their transportation partners saying, what should we ask for? I think this could be one that could certainly be on the top of that list. And, and I can't encourage you or discourage you to do anything, do it either way. That's not my position to do that. So you do whatever you would like to do in this area. But if, if anybody is ever going to meet with federal highway leadership or DOT mm -hmm. leadership, um, you're welcome to give me a call to let me know that's happening. Because then I can at least try and make an effort to help have the right people around the table. I've had different groups go up, they want to talk about this, and I hear, well, who's sitting at the table? I heard that who was sitting at the table, and it's a whole different group that they don't have anything to do with. So, I'd, you know, if you're going to go and talk with uh, my leadership in Federal Highway, I'd like for it to be a productive conversation for you also. So if you're doing any on any uh, okay. trip to okay. D.C., if you're having a meeting with the um, Secretary's Office or Federal Highway, I, I can't always get everybody there, um, but I can maybe help and, and kind of inform that discussion some if you ever need that. That'd be great. So let's say that we collectively agree that we want to increase the congressional reimbursement uh, so it comes faster. If you can help us talk to the right people with that, too. I think for all of us, we can, we can get behind doing I mean, it. I'm not going to commit to that because it's probably against the law for me to say yes. <laughs> I know you can't. <laughs> But we, I hear what you're saying, though. We get it. We get it. But, yeah. um, okay, a few other things. Uh, CEPA uh, for, or CEQA for NEPA. Um, there was, a, we talked, I think I may have talked about it this last time, I'm not positive. Uh, FAST Act had an opportunity for states, five, up to five states, to use their state environmental law in lieu of the federal law. The big thing on that was nobody wanted to do it because there was the, um, the statute of limitations on lawsuits back against that was two years in, in the FAST Act. Well, a recent uh, FAA legislation has shortened that down to 150 days, so that's an opportunity, and, and uh, Lori and I are talking about that. Uh, we're going to be working with Caltrans to see whether or not Caltrans would want to go down that path, but ultimately that would be replacing NEPA, so you wouldn't have NEPA and CEQA, you would just have CEQA. And CEQA would represent all of the environmental law that happens. Um, don't know where we're at with that. There's some few things that CEQA, that NEPA has that CEQA doesn't cover, so we would have to make sure all that kind of gets together. But, you know, Caltrans was the first, or California was the first state to do NEPA assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, you know, and I think this change to 150 days for the statute of limitations is a big, big, big deal um, that kind of allows this, at least put it back on the table for discussion, I think. Um, so we'll work with you guys on that. Um, the executive order, we've talked about the one federal decision, so we're still waiting on um, uh, e CEQ to come back with some guidance on how we deal with the one federal decision um, for all documents, for, for all federal agencies, we're still working with them on how we do that with NEPA assignment states. So there's a little bit different dance that has to happen. So we're looking for some guidance from CEQ, uh, CEQ so that should be coming out. Um, there was a final rule that happened recently, uh, 1029, not, not long ago, um, that and this is something uh, Commissioner von Kaninenberg had talked about or uh, asked for some information on also. Um, and it's a, it was the final rule that brought modal categorical exclusions. So modal being federal, federal rail administration, federal transit, and federal highway. First thing it did is it brought federal transit, I mean federal rail administration under 23 CFR environmental regulation. That was, un, federal rail was under a separate one. Now federal rail is under with federal highway, federal transit, and federal rail. All three of us are following the same federal regulation. Hopefully that makes that a little bit better, or a lot of bit better. Um, this new rule also says that each of the modal agencies can accept the other modal agencies' environmental documents or categorical exclusion. So if FTA has a categorical exclusion on a project, what typically will happen is Federal Highway will have a categorical exclusion on a project, and then another agency might have money on it also, so they have to 
And sometimes the other agency will do a, another environmental document instead of just accepting federal highways. This rule allows each of the modal agencies to accept each other's categorical exclusions. Makes sense. Seems like it should have been already happening that way. Sorry about that, but it does now. Um, the, it also got into some of the 4F and uh, uh, some of the other areas, but ultimately that was our biggest, the biggest thing. Um, it also gives the opportunity to combine, the, combine the, the final environmental impact statement, so this is the federal words, um, with the record of decision. So final environmental impact statement is the, raw, is the, the EIS that you have, that you do, do all the studies, and the record of decision is your decision, and those are usually separated, and it gives you the opportunity to combine those, which should save some time uh, in the process. Um, do, do, do. Inactive obligations, let's keep that up. Yay, yay, yay. We did great last year. Um, I want to thank Caltrans uh, staff and many others here in the, in the office here, or in the, in the audience here, I think, participated in our Everyday Counts Summit. We had an Everyday Counts Summit um, up in Oregon not long ago, and uh, we had a great participation from Caltrans staff. We had local leaders. Um, we had um, our uh, LTAP Center, we had a lot of people from California represented at that thing, and it's really pushing innovation. What are we doing in California to push innovation? There's some, some rollout things that Federal Highway has that are considered known, and these are good opportunities that you can explore and move forward with. And then the big thing for us in California is how are we doing that here in California, we have a, a STIC, a State Transportation Innovation Council um, that we're working. We just got some funding that came from our headquarters on that, Some a couple of the initiatives that we have, and I know the, the commission is represented on that. Um, so a lot of movement in that area. I want to appreciate, want to thank everybody who is participating in that. Um, lastly, I th well, we're hitting, uh, there's, we are, there's a, uh, a uh, proposed rulemaking out in the Federal Register right now on patented and proprietary items. It's a big, big issue for us. Um, and, and there's a lot of restriction that federal, the federal requirements have on patented and proprietary items. Um, so if you've ever delivered a project and you have that widget that only one person makes that widget and you want to put it on the project, you got to go through this process. And, and hopefully this uh, kind of makes that a little bit uh, uh, a little bit more flexible with a little bit more opportunity to explore some of the, the innovations that are out there. Lastly, DBE, we've got a new DBE goal in the state of California. 17.6 goal, I just got in recent approval of that from the Secretary's office. So DBE's Disadvantaged Business Enterprises, I think we were at 12 and a half, rings a bell if I'm remembering correctly. Um, we achieved that very well. Uh, I'll say this, um, ten, year, 10 years ago, I'll say this a bunch of times, 10 years ago when I came in this door, we were right about 1.5 to 2.5% participation with disadvantaged businesses, minorities and disadvantaged businesses. Um, and now you're at 17.5% is the goal. And everybody's sitting there going, how are we going to accomplish 17.5 when we were struggling to get to 13.5? Well, just so you know, as of November 15th, you were 168 16.8 on contracts that are going out there. That is incredible. Um, locals have a lot to do with that. 40% uh, of our federal aid dollars go to locals here in California. Um, I've had some discussions with people on, you know, with SB1 coming, how are we going to use that force? How is that number going to blow up and cover everything? The 17.6% goal is on federal aid dollars. That 17 per 6 goal isn't on every dollar in transportation in California. It's a percentage that goes against the federal aid dollars. Um, and I think that's all tribes. Got to say tribes again. I uh, had an opportunity to meet with a, a couple tribes. I know District 1 had, uh, uh, had a good re outreach session with tribes in, up in North, uh, North Country up there. It was great meetings, I understand. A lot of tribal representation on just how to work in the process, how to how to deal with the federal dollars, state dollars, how do they work with projects? So I would encourage everybody, locals and districts and everybody to keep reaching out to your tribes in your area uh, to make sure they're part of your decisions. That's all I got. Okay, questions? 
Yes, Commissioner Burke. Uh, not a question, but I really would urge the members of the board and the staff when they are contacting people at Federal Highway that they touch base with you first. I think that it's not just a courtesy, it's a matter that uh, there's never a conflict in terms of the ass and uh, also <laughs> the goals. So uh, I would urge everyone, uh, just as a courtesy, to have, make sure that there's a touch base before uh, and he doesn't have to be the one who sets the appointment, but at the same time, he should know if you're meeting. All right. And I, and I can help set appointments. And like I said, I, I want to make sure you have a productive conversation with the people you're trying and you're trying to resolve an issue. So I just want to make sure you have the right people around the table and you're not wasting your time because it's a pretty good hike. And Federal Highway doesn't want to waste your time either. So thank you for that. Yes, Secretary Annis. Yeah, Madam Chair, I just wanted to, uh, Vince's uh, discussion of the increased percentage for disadvantaged uh, businesses did re remind me that, uh, you know, we have very high state goals in that area, too. Mm -hmm. And I think that higher percent of the federal target is going to be very helpful for California. <laughs> There's a companion bill to Senate Bill 1 that uh, requires the state to double the amount of funding that's going to disadvantage and minority businesses. And again, uh, happy to have that, uh, that uh, federal tool as it gives us some additional authorities in California to help achieve that. And I know Janice Elias and her team, uh, and it isn't just Janice, I think one of the areas that she's, and even your previous people have directed that, um, uh, uh, Office of Business and Economic Opportunity Office have done a great job of incorporating this, making this not just a one unit. You know, I know other people have silos, but uh, clearly we have cylinders of excellence here in California, and people are crossing these cylinders of excellence to make sure everybody is all part of that. So I think it's a big, it, it only gets accomplished if everybody's plan. So forgive my ignorance, you talked about just getting a California goal. So is our goal different than other people's? Yes. Yeah. Every state has its own goal. So you've done just recently you've, you uh, completed a disparity study that evaluated okay. all the the industry, who's available, what contractors are out there, what's, you know, so essentially went through and looked at everything. And that's where they came up with a, a goal of, and the only way you can have goals, ind individual goals on a contract in the Ninth Circuit Court area is if you've done a disparity study. So that disparity study has gone out, it's been out for public comment, came back, and then, uh, um, so now we're moving on trying to accomplish that. Okay. It's a lot of work done on that uh, contracting industry. It's it's very difficult. So we're trying to get everybody in, and um, and trying to to get as many disadvantaged businesses certified as we possibly can. Okay. Great. Okay. No further questions. Thanks, well, Ben. Wish you all a merry Christmas and a happy New Year. Merry Christmas. Ben. Merry Christmas. What's the theme this year? All right. <laughs> Sorry, the, the question was the question was what's the theme? So every year we do a little bit of Christmas decorations at our household, and it's always reindeer training academy, Cape Claws. They're Cape. They're training the reindeer to do something. This year is reindeer training academy's talent show. Uh -oh. So we've got a rock band, we've got jugglers, we've got a magic. Show. It's very exciting. <laughs> But we are taking collections for the electric bill, so. Okay, it's uh, Vince Mamano does Mission in. <laughs> okay, we're going to move on now. Item number 12, regional agencies. Moderator, Luke. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners, Assemblyman Frazier. Uh, I am Luke McNeil Caridon with the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency and the RTPA moderator for fiscal year 2018-2019. Uh, we met this morning and of course the regions are very excited uh, to partner with the CTC now that Senate Bill 1, as one put it, person put it, uh, it's no longer a pond but a river. So we're, we're looking forward to the funding that's coming. Uh, we are looking forward to the next cycle of SB1 uh, funded programs. Um, and constructing projects that are going to improve a uh, transportation system throughout California. And specifically, uh, one of the most critical uh, programs, of course, is the solutions for congested corridors because it really covers all modes of transportation. 
And so uh, staff did have a, a CTC staff had a robust uh, outreach and the RTPA group uh, supports the adoption of the 2018 multimodal corridor plan guidelines uh, so that we can begin updating and developing corridor plans. Uh, I will say these plans are gonna result in uh, collaboration across um, agencies that may not have occurred otherwise. Um, and also uh, public outreach, uh, including users of the transportation facility. So we're looking forward to that. On a, a separate but related note, uh, the regions are looking forward to seeing the first draft of the Caltrans uh, corridor planning guidebook uh, for projects on the statewide or state highway system. And we look forward to reviewing and providing input on that document. Lastly, on a more uh, Placer County specific note, uh, as uh, Executive Director Branson noted, uh, the 2019 CTC calendar has been updated and Placer County Transportation Planning Agency is looking forward to hosting the CTC meeting in January in Rockland. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We have any questions? Hearing none, thank you. Thank you. We're Okay, we'll move to item number 13, the rural counties. Maura, and thank you again, Maura, for your uh, presentation yesterday. You're very welcome. It was my pleasure. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Maura Toomey, Chair of the Rural Counties Task Force. The Rural Counties Task Force met on November 30th and discussed the following issues and concerns. First, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Commissioner Van Kenijnenberg for attending the Rural Counties meeting and sharing his perspective on rural transportation issues. The Rural Counties appreciated his time and the opportunity to discuss their concerns and challenges. In regard to the comprehensive multimodal corridor plan guidelines, the Rural Counties appreciate the Commission's consideration of their concerns and the efforts of Commission staff to develop the guidelines in an open and transparent manner. The rural counties support staff recommendation to adopt the 2018 Comprehensive Multimodal Corridor Plan Guidelines. And that concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, Commissioner Gometti. Well, I also want to thank you for your very thoughtful presentation at uh, our ARB meeting, as well as the other MPOs. I thought all of you guys did a great job yesterday. Thank you very much. Thank you. We, we appreciated the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Maura. We'll move to item 14, the self-help counties. Keith Dunn. And Keith, I can't help but uh, reach out to you. Just I know you hail from Chico, and so I know we have Yvonne here as well. And I'm hearing wonderful stories of Chico Cares or Chico Strong, I'm not sure I have the right uh, logo and tagline, but do you want to share just a little bit about your community and what's happening? Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Chairman, Chairwoman. Um, you know, it's Butte Strong, and, and as a Chico native, I had the blessing of growing up in a community that's extremely tight-knit. I actually was married in Megalia and lived in Megalia for seven years. My entire street that I lived on is gone, as well as several neighbors that are still on the missing list. So it's a very personal story for, for many in the community. And I would just, I guess if I was going to communicate one thing about uh, Butte County specifically, but they're a, they are a resilient a community and a community that really cares deeply for our neighbors. And I think you're seeing that play out to those of us that have lived there. It's not a huge surprise. Um, the Ridge and Paradise Megalia for, for forever uh, had talked about the catastrophic, uh, catastrophic fire that could potentially come and, and, and visit that area. I think that a lot of us were surprised. Uh, the Feather River Canyon, which sits to the east and south of the ridge, usually those burn up and uh, this fire with the winds, the way they were blowing, just really took off from a different direction and shut off a lot of the, uh, the few evacuation routes that were there. So it was about as bad a scenario as you could imagine uh, the community is for the most part gone, uh, but I think you're going to see uh, a lot of people that'll go back, some that won't. But uh, as a citizen and, and and someone who's lived there for since I was three, um, it's really been uh, uh, great to see everyone come together, take people in, uh, have people come and we've got R two D two visiting. <laughs> uh, so I, I appreciate I appreciate the. Uh, 
the inquiry, what I would tell you is that there's been uh, extreme generosity, not only from people in the community, but for those outside. We have a fa favorite son, uh, Aaron Rodgers, who uh, many of you know, uh, plays for the Packers. He went to my high school, uh, played at Butte College. He's donated a million dollars to the Community Foundation, and there's been a lot of folks that are reaching out to match that. Christmas is coming. We've got 4,000 kids from the Paradise School District who've all been displaced. Their first day back at school was this Monday. Um, many of them are attending in temporary buildings and or being absorbed by the Chico Unified School District. So it's been a real effort that I've been uh, proud to play a small part in helping assist with. But it's a great community and, and really wonderful people who've really shown what I've known to be the case for a long time and that you're, we're there to help our neighbors and our community. So thank you very much for your inquiry. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. With that, I would uh, like to give my self-help update. Um, I'm glad that the fairness doctrine is no longer in place or I'd ask for the same 25 minutes that Vince got. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was a pleasure yesterday to join you at your joint ARB meeting. Uh, I was pleased to uh, have the opportunity to talk about the self-help counties and the successes of the self-help counties specifically, and I'm just going to repeat it again, that you know we pride ourselves on promises made, promises kept. Again, page uh, 59 in their report talked about opening up expenditure plans and having them go to other purposes we would have extreme issue that would be the holy grail of fights um, and we would we would address it as such it's a terrible idea to try and open those up the trust of the voters is what makes the self-help county so successful so i just want to state that again page 59 in the ab 150 report talks about opening it up it says some advocates say that we should do that it's a terrible idea and we would fight that tooth and nail so i uh, can't say it enough um, Looking into 2019, we're all very happy with the outcome of the recent elections. Uh, most people here had significant roles in making sure that that outcome was uh, achieved. We're looking to partner with Chairman Frazier to uh, extend the NEPA assignment delegation again. We're hoping that we're going to be removing any of the deadlines or the, excuse me, the sunsets that had been previously assigned to that. This will be our third go around on it. We think it's kind of ridiculous to keep putting this deadline. It just makes busy work uh, for all of us and we don't want to do that. We're also as a self-help coalition are uh, looking at some work groups that hopefully we'll be partnering with, with the CTC or staff as well as Caltrans to look at how we're um, delivering projects and working together. We have a great partnership with you. We'd like to extend that, make sure that we're complementing each other. I think that we've got uh, a lot of great history to build off of, and we're looking forward very much to continuing that effort. So with that, I, I'm very privileged to work with the Self-Help County Coalition executives and staff, everyone who makes up these groups. Um, some things that I get to do are uh, a little more fun than others. One of the things that I really enjoy is the annual Sisyphus Award, which we give to uh, members of the community who've really achieved either a lifelong accomplishment or made great strides in um, advancing the transportation community and infrastructure uh, throughout California. So at this time, I would really like to uh, ask some of the executive directors who are in the audience to come up here with me just for a second here. Ooh, I'm gonna put this up here on the, the Sisyphus Ooh. Award. So for those of you who aren't aware, uh, Sisyphus was uh, condemned to push a rock up a mountain for his entire life. I find great joy in the story. I was a history major in college and my dad used to make me move uh, stacks of wood back and forth and he would tell me the story of Sisyphus and tell me it was, it was only for the summer so I should stop complaining. So I, I, I like to, ha we have this award that we like to uh, give out to very special people. Um, one of the recipients is here today. Uh, we're gonna let Dr. Wolf uh, make the announcement and say a few words, but uh, this is the Sisyphus Award for 2018 for the self-help counties. And with that, Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the commission. The uh, annual Sisyphus Award is awarded every year at the Focus on the Future event. And unfortunately, this year's recipient wasn't able to make it uh, to the event. I will tell you that uh, Papa Joe, uh, is this year's uh, award recipient. Uh, he's someone.
As you all know, Commissioner Tavaloni has served with extreme distinction on this commission for nearly two decades now and has been a tremendous partner and advocate for transportation across California uh, throughout that time period. And so, Joe, we truly appreciate everything you've done for the Inland Empire, everything you've done for the state of California and the residents and businesses in this state to try to help to improve the quality of life and mobility not only for generations today, but generations to come. It's been an honor and a pleasure of mine. We love you, Papa Joe. We'll pause a minute for a photo op. Can we get this picture with all of them? Uh, he needs to go <laughs> down there. But yeah, we need it. Oh. Amy, you got it? Okay. Better go on the mic, Papa Joe. Yeah. There's a handheld mic. Yeah. It's working? Yep. Okay. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know it. <laughs> I'm not good at jokes, Papa Joe. <laughs> well, um, as, as you all know, um, this belongs to everyone sitting up there. Everybody knows that no one person does it alone. Well, you know, I shouldn't just stand here and take all your time, but, but, you know, I have a great family. I have one great family, great, great family, and over the years I've acquired my other family. Hey. And these folks... Gosh, I, I just... And I, I just and, and I hate to stand here and, and be be such a baby, but you know it's it's um, being a part of this family that we've got up here has been a big big pleasure in my life and my other family's life. They have done so much for me, they have helped me so much because. It's a family. And when you have folks like I've got, you can't find these folks out just all over because these folks know what a family means. And all of you folks in the audience have been a big help. And I just want you all to know that I'm so grateful Well, I guess I'm just going to let it go with that. Thank you.
We all love our Papa Joe. So Keith, did you have anything else? Was that no, finished? Uh, okay. Forward to 2019. If anybody has questions. Do we have any questions regarding Keith's presentation? No. Oh yes, Commissioner Van Kenneinenberg. Sorry, but one item I probably should have brought up that was a discussion at the rural counties that we probably should look at at some point in the future was many of the rural counties and their RTPs have secondary uh, evacuation routes in their RTPs, but they're really an unfundable right now in the way our, our funding structure works. They don't have a, a real funding stream for those secondary evacuation routes and RTPs uh, to in their RTPs. And so one of the things, uh, Assemblymember Frazier, you might want to consider uh, is maybe have a discussion with your colleagues about how do you approach um, those secondary evacuation routes. And, and I would encourage you to uh, get with Maura uh, and, and hear more about what, what those are going on. Because it was uh, many of the mountain counties have particular communities that are kind of one way in, one way out. So, And uh, just to follow up a little bit on that, I, I know there's a task force that's been pulled together regarding the wildfires, but I'm going to make sure our transportation partners are at that table and participating because we're not first responders, but we're clearly right there, right with the first responders. So uh, add our thanks to all the efforts and the teamwork and everything that went on. So, And I'll just close this item member by saying we all love Papa Joe. So congratulations. Okay, we're going to move on to item number 15, Innovations in Transportation. Yes, Commissioners, uh, tab 15 is an informational item, and, and today we're fortunate to have Japanese Consul yes, Koji Imai, along with uh, Mr. Nobu uh, Nozaki and Mr. Uh, Masashi Nagano from uh, Gaiken Co America Corporation to discuss an innovative pile driving method developed in Japan. First off, Consul Imai will say a few words regarding an agreement between the government of Japan and California to further advance shared items re relating to sustainability. Fo fo following the uh, Council's remarks, uh, we'll have a presentation on Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Koji Mai from Consulate General of Japan. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to be with you here today. Uh, for many years, uh, actually since 1988, the United States or uh, the United States Department of Transportation and Japan have had agreements on sharing technology information, and it was most recently updated in 2017. And in 2014, four years ago, California and Japan signed a similar agreement. In the spirit of these agreements, we are very happy to have this chance to share a unique technology which is very useful in difficult and sensitive construction situations. Thank you again. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is Nobu Nozaki, and I'm the general manager of Giken America. Our company, Giken, is a manufacturer of environmentally friendly piling machine called Silent Piler. Our global headquarters invest in Tokyo, Japan, and our U.S. headquarters in Orlando, Florida. We also have an office in New York. Today, um, I'd like to provide a four minutes presentation outlining our pressing piling machine and actual case study. Welcome to this Geekin online presentation. This presentation describes details and advantages of the press-in method. Next, you will see the mechanism of the press-in method. The basis of the press-in method is simple. The silent piler obtains its reaction force by gripping previously installed piles in the ground, which are called reaction piles. Then, based on the reaction piles, the silent piler installs piles into the ground using static loading. Cities do not sleep. The beat of the city continues all day, every day, as if it is a living life form. Therefore, urban renewal in densely populated areas is not easy 
and sometimes overlooked. For example, level crossings often continue to exist as obstacles, causing bottlenecks in the community. As a result, at-grade railways often hinder daily activities. In this railway rehabilitation project, the at-grade railway was relocated adjacent to the existing lines as part of the grade separation project. The existing railway was located in a narrow corridor due to the adjacent private properties and a steep embankment. As such, it was necessary to install a retaining wall into the embankment. In order to provide a cantilevered retaining wall with a retained height of up to 14.8 meters, steel tubular piles with a diameter of 1,000 millimeters were installed. With such constrained site conditions, the press-in method was utilized in order to avoid interrupting railway operations. With the press-in method, all the steps including transportation, pitching, and pressing in the piles are completed on the piles. Each mechanical device stands on its own while gripping previously installed piles. Therefore, there is no risk of toppling over and construction can be performed as long as there is enough space for the width of the machine. Hence, this footprint-free installation method can be carried out within an extremely constricted working space. This enabled the piling works to be carried out during the day while normal train operations continued. Also, on this project, it was necessary to install the tubular piles into sandstone with the unconfined compressive strength of up to 70 megapascals. In order to achieve this, the rotary jack-in method, called gyropress method, was utilized. The firmly embedded steel tubular piles formed a cantilevered retaining wall, creating space for the new railway. Also, the press-in method allowed simultaneous bulk excavation works, which achieved a significant reduction in construction time. After the excavation, a surface coating was applied to the retaining wall. In conclusion, the railway improvement project was completed with minimum construction cost and time by utilizing the press-in method. Giken. Construction Revolution. Thank you, attention, and uh, also thank you very much for giving us this opportunity today. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Was that a question or just you were liking it? Just a comment, very impressive. Thank you much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we will now move on to item 16, I believe. Jofu? Good afternoon, commissioners. Assemblymember Frazier, Mr. Annis. Tab 16 is an action item related to federal and state legislative matters. First, just want to give you a brief update on the transportation informational workshop that we hosted at the end of October 24, 2018. The Commission, in collaboration with the Assembly and Senate Transportation Committees and the Senate Office of Research, hosted this first informational workshop for legislative staff um, that's provided as an educational series uh, designed to provide high-level overview of key issues in transportation as well as introduce staff members to agencies, departments, and partner organizations that are involved in influencing the state's transportation infrastructure. We are pleased to announce that we had an amazing turnout from a variety of offices, agencies, public and private partners, and the first workshop featured Commission, Caltrans, and California Council of Government staff, who each shared about their perspective roles in the transportation system. Uh, we received positive responses, questions, and requests for future collaboration on follow-up workshops and topics, and Commission staff is pleased to continue to report the progress of these next year's engagements. 
Also, an update on state and legislative affairs. The 2019-20 legislative session started on December 3rd with an organizational session and swearing in of members of both the Assembly and the Senate. 60 of the 80 Assembly seats would be controlled by the Democratic Party, with eight new members joining. 29 of the 40 senators coming, are also coming in from the Democratic Party and will be joined by nine newly elected senators. Counties will still submit their official results to the Secretary of State by December 7th, and the department has until December 14th to certify statewide results. Wanted to share that this is a historic turnout for California in a non-presidential election. This year's numbers are on pace to have the highest participation, about 64% among registered voters, which is the highest since 1982. While there is supermajority established in the le state legislature, this does not necessarily mean super consensus among all members. Commission staff continues to promote partnership with elected members, provide technical assistance to the legislature, and identify strategic opportunities for engagement as well as implementing our legislative recommendations. Finally, I ask that you accept the staff report attached to this item and reaffirm existing procedures for monitoring legislation in the upcoming legislative session. The following criteria that guides our policies in monitoring and selecting bills for positions was previously introduced in December 2009, and I ask you for your support, and it has been reaffirmed since. Happy to answer any questions or comments that you may have, but that concludes my report, and I ask for your, your vote on that item. Thank you. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Badaffer, a second by Commissioner Arp. Any discussion on this item? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? That motion carries. Okay, we will now go to the budget and allocation capacity. Jofa. Item 17, uh, we have Mr. Clark Paulson from the Division of Budgets at Caltrans. Um, some of you may not know, but he is a proud father of three daughters and a big fan of BYU football. So Clark Paulson, take it away. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not always an easy thing. <laughs> I'm pleased to be here. Good afternoon. Uh, I'll be reporting uh, today on uh, budget capacity. And there's a presentation. So uh, uh, first of all, uh, our status as of the end of October for uh, all programs, uh, the commission has allocated uh, $3.3 billion uh, uh, to date and has $3.6 billion remaining in capacity. So through the uh, October meeting, uh, we're at 48%, which is uh, a, a good progress uh, through the fiscal year. Uh, this includes uh, a number of the SB1 programs that, uh, that have uh, that uh, similar progress uh, as it relates to the whole. I wanted to provide some information about the uh, public transportation account and its balance. Uh, this is really, to some extent, a preview of the upcoming fund estimate uh, and the information that will come forward in more detail uh, through the fund estimate process. Uh, just as a, as a reminder, the public transportation account uh, revenue sources are primarily two sources. One, the sales tax on, on diesel uh, fuel sales. And secondly, the SB1 uh, uh, created uh, vehicle-based uh, transportation improvement fee. The primary uses of the public transportation account are uh, transportation planning, inner city rail, and transit, uh, including uh, some STIP uh, funded projects. So uh, if you look at the, the chart, uh, the higher, darker green uh, um, bar shows for 24 months uh, the uh, forecast of uh, balance for the public transportation account. The lower bar with the lighter green color uh, represents the, that balance after you take away the commitments for the transit inner city rail capital program. So the primary message I wanted to convey is that although the, tr uh, the public transportation account uh, balance sometimes may appear large, and that sometimes creates the thought that there are resources that are available for many different things. If you look out uh, towards the end of the 24 month period, uh, the reality that is that the uncommitted resources of the public transportation account are really quite minimal. And, and so this is something that will show up as we get into the details of the fund estimate. Uh, and it will reflect that uh, the available funds, particularly for STIP projects associated with the public transportation account, will be very limited. Uh, 
and, and this is, uh, again, just uh, the thought of, uh, of conveying what may be misleading in terms of uh, balances in the public transportation account and the reality of uh, resources that are available for um, discretionary use. Um, uh, Mr. Mamano uh, has already uh, talked a little bit about continuing resolutions. Uh, I'll just say that uh, our recommendation is that this has almost become the routine mm -hmm. and we don't advise any uh, alteration to uh, the Commission's actions related to federal funding. Uh, I'll also note, since this was a matter of discussion, that uh, I had participated uh, a week or two ago in a discussion with the Governor's Office of Emergency Services who has compiled uh, financial need from the state uh, in a variety of different functions, including transportation, as it relates to emergency response. And the, emergency, uh, the Office of Emergency Services is uh, reaching out to federal uh, legislative offices, uh, Senator Feinstein and others, seeking uh, the, the additional funding that uh, will be helpful, not only for the recent fires, but for the uh, long-term uh, uh, issues associated with transportation. So, so to, the, uh, to the note that um, the timing might be good to uh, advocate, uh, the, uh, the governor's office and Caltrans are participating in that effort. Uh, and finally, uh, just a, a note of a couple of things coming up. Uh, we have begun uh, the 2020 STIP fund estimate process. Uh, our, our first steps uh, engage uh, commission staff and department staff in identifying assumptions and making forecasts. In January, the, the governor's budget will be proposed um, with, uh, of course, the uh, significant influence of uh, the governor-elect. And, uh, and we will, in, in the uh, meeting in January, come forward to talk about uh, the overview of the fund estimate process. And then over the next uh, several uh, commission meetings, talk about uh, the, uh, or work towards the adoption of the fund estimate. And uh, that uh, concludes my presentation. Any questions? Yes. Questions, Commissioner Gamedi? Clark, refresh my memory. The, um, it seems to me that the excess right-of-way proceeds were going, being swept into the PTA account. Is that still happening? Uh, no. Uh, so the, uh, the excess, re uh, excess land uh, sale proceeds are swept into uh, what is, amounts to uh, an offshoot of the general fund for purposes of paying transportation bond debt. So, um, Assemblyman Fraser, if we could fix this, because this is money that came straight out of the state highway account that's supposed to be protected under Article 19. And when we do have excess sales of right of way, uh, it seems to me it should go straight back to the state highway account. And that's not been happening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any other? Discussions? Chair Fraser, did you want to add? Well, that's, that seems to be an ongoing theme when we look at how things are purchased and then things get swept up into the general fund due to need, but then the institutional no, knowledge goes away. So we'll look forward to, to uh, reapproaching that process and making sure, due to Article 19, that it is, and if there is any clawback, that we'll be very, very uh, cognizant of that going after that also. Great, thank you. Okay, well I think the next item is timely. We are now gonna have a presentation on the future of California transportation revenue. Yes, commissioners, uh, tab 18 is an informational item and Professor Asha Weinstein-Agua is a director of the uh, National Transportation Finance Center at San Jose State University's Mineta Transportation Institute. And Professor um, Agua, will provide an overview of the Institute's uh, recently titled report, uh, The Future of Transportation Revenue. With that, Professor? Thank you very much, and Commissioners. I very much appreciate a chance to share with you the results of some recent research. I had had a slide presentation. Is it possible to put that up? Thank you. Um, first, just a couple quick acknowledgments. This is a project that I've done together with two co-authors, Dr. Martin Wax, whom I think many of you know at UCLA, and also Hannah King, a doctoral student there. And the work was funded by the Mineta Transportation Institute. 
So we had a pretty straightforward goal for this project. We wanted to project out through 2040 transportation revenues available to the state of California. And I, I should specify that we are looking only at revenues that are, are collected by the state. So for example, local option sales taxes, which are controlled by the counties, were not part of our work. And we were also looking only at transportation revenues that are actually spent for the state's you know, core transportation programs. So for example, the vehicle license fee was not included because that revenue is not being plowed back into maintaining and operating our transportation infrastructure. The methods we used um, were um, sort of the technical term, I suppose, would be spreadsheet models. Um, basically, these were pretty straightforward models where we looked at a large number of inputs you know, projected number of vehicles in the state, uh, gas prices, inflation, you know, all these different things um, to estimate what the revenues would be from these different sources going out over time. Um, and all of the inputs were just taken from kind of very widely used government sources like the US Energy Information Agency. We weren't I'm trying to be too creative there. Um, and as I mentioned, we were trying to look at different, you know, the impact of different population um, features, economy changing, et cetera. So what I want to show you here is um, these were our global projections. Um, and we were looking at the world with and without SB1, since at the time we did the work, we weren't sure which way the world would be looking. Um, so I think probably to the, the pleasure of all in this room, or at least most, we are in the world of that upper blue bar. So this is revenues with SB1. And uh, just as a reminder, there are a number of different revenues that fall under that umbrella. The gasoline excise tax, diesel taxes, um, also transportation improvement fee, and some other kind of per vehicle fees. And uh, I think the key message, aside from the fact that the blue line is a lot higher than that beige colored one, is that we see, um, and by the way, I should say these are inflation adjusted numbers. So um, we see an increase in revenue. So it's you know, fairly sharp to 2020, and then a gradual decline. And the reason for this is quite simple, which is that the, the terms of SB1 will be raising some additional revenue you know, rates and fees through 2020, and then after that, there will be no other increases other than some cost of um, some inflation adjustments. Um, and you'll see that, you know, at its highest point, we would estimate a bit over 10 billion in 2020, and then that kind of gradually moves down um, over the next couple of decades. Just to mention a couple of other things that may be of interest to the group. Here, what I've done, I'm just looking at the world we're in, the world with SB1 maintained, and I've broken out the different revenue sources that all get lumped together into the previous um, graphic that you just saw. And so you will see that the gas tax is you know, at the top. So that is indeed where the majority of the revenues will be coming from even through 2040 under the terms of the, the projections we did. And let me just here add a few more notes about what you did so you understand some of the important details. Um, one thing is that we don't have lines on our graphs. We have these colored bands. And the reason for that is that we very much think it's important to acknowledge that so many different factors will play out to determine our futures, and it would be very unlikely that anybody could predict one point, so to speak, one number, and we think it's much more realistic to look at this kind of range of likely futures given different scenarios that we looked at. Um, and so that's why we have these bands. And, oh. So the other thing I wanted to point out is that a lot of our projection, um, one of the key factors in gasoline tax revenues will be how many vehicles are using gasoline um, or how many are, say, gas hybrids that are getting very high fuel efficiency. One of the choices that we did make when we were projecting out was to decide when we're uh, predicting what 
the fleet averages of, of vehicle fuel efficiency will be, we basically projected current trends continuing. Now, the state has very ambitious policy goals um, to really increase the efficiency of our fleet quite fast. Um, if those were to be realized, then the picture would be a little bit different. But if you just look at current trends, um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're moving too quickly towards meeting those goals. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that that gasoline tax um, line at the bottom could slope down quite a bit faster if indeed the state's goals for you know, reducing gas usage are achieved. Um, and then you'll see sort of down near the bottom the transportation improvement fee, which is a, sort of a surcharge on vehicle registration fees, um, and then diesel taxes. And at the very bottom, this road improvement fee, which is a brand new fee that is assessed um, once a year on owners of all electric vehicles or, or vehicles that don't use any gasoline. And so you'll see that that is pretty small. It's $100 a year fee, but we just aren't projecting that many of these vehicles, at least given the way current trends suggest things are going. Um, this is just looking at the same information in a different way. Apologies for the rather violent colors here. Um, but it's, so if we look at sort of all state revenues for transportation um, for each year, what proportion is coming from the different sources? Um, and so again, you'll see that gas taxes, um, excise taxes are well over half of the revenue that would be collected by the state through 2040. So I think it's important for, for you um, and others that you work with to sort of reflect. We often hear that the gas tax is almost dead. Um, and I firmly believe there are a lot of good reasons we may want to move to mileage fees and other um, forms of taxation. But unless our fuel, um, our fuel efficiency, sort of fleet-wide, changes dramatically, in the next couple of decades, the gas tax still has the potential to be bringing in quite a lot of revenue. Um, so it's just something, I'm not saying it's good or bad, just merely an observation that I would put out for everybody to, to keep in mind. Um, also, I'm not going to talk in much depth, but a, a final piece of this report was reflecting on the fact that um, at some point the state legislature is likely going to need to bring in additional revenues um, for transportation. If that happens, there needs to be some rough consensus among legislators and the public about what might be appropriate. And so here I'm just reporting on a series of annual, these are national surveys, but I can informally tell you California looks about the same. Um, and these were random digit dial phone polls asking Americans, would you support increasing um, um, the federal gas tax rate, for example. Um, and, and we have various op sort of versions of, of what that tax increase could look like. We tell people in each case it would be 10 cents per gallon, but we, we then create variations. Like, well, what if the money were only spent on maintenance? Um, and actually, that in 2017, we got 78% of our respondents saying that they would either somewhat or strongly support um, raising federal gas tax. 10 cents per gallon if the money is dedicated for maintenance. Um, and what I think is interesting here, I'm not going to sort of read more numbers, but just point out two trends. One is as you sort of move down, you know, we go, the most popular version that we asked about was for maintenance. Um, second most popular version we asked about was a gas tax where the revenue would be dedicated for projects to improve safety. Um, local air pollution and global warming were also pretty popular. Um, and then we sort of work our way down to the bottom, which is when we told folks, well, you would just be paying 10 cents more per gallon for transportation. And no additional information was shared with people. And I think it's quite striking and important than that very generic gas tax for transportation was not popular. Roughly a third of people said they would support that. But once you start giving people more information or dedicating the revenues to specific purposes, not projects here, but just categories of expenditures, support went markedly up. Um, and then the other thing is we are looking at data here from 2010 to 2017. And so in each, for each of these different um, kind of clumps at the bottom, you have the oldest data. And so you'll see that there has been more 
more or less a gradual increase in support for all these different options over this period of, of quite a few years. So with that, I'll just um, thank you very much again for the opportunity to be here. Happy to answer any questions. And there are, of course, reams of charts and tables and more information in MTI reports if any of you should be interested to look at them. OK, I'm sure we're going to have some questions. Yes, Chair Frazier. Uh, so thank you for that comprehensive approach um, mm -hmm. and, and breaking it down. Mm -hmm. Did this actually include uh, the tax, the additional taxes on fuel, like the LCFS, fuels under the cap, the summer blended uh, additional cost going forward? Um, I'm not going to be able to give you a very precise answer because I didn't do all of the the sort of the modeling and that, that spreadsheet model. Um, but I will say we, we sort of worked carefully with documents from for California legislative analysts, et cetera. We were also pulling in a lot of the forecasts um, for fuel consumption were based on the Federal Energy Information Administration. Um, and they have it, actually 50 different scenarios they look at with you know different economic outcomes and different um, fuel efficiency rates of vehicles and such. So I'm guessing that we have at least more or less taken into account what you're saying, but I could certainly get back to you later with a more precise answer if you want me to. I would really appreciate that because none of those funds go to transportation whatsoever. They're, they're, uh, they're, then, they're not applied at that. And okay. they, you know, so. I think if the public actually knew that there was additional costs that they bear uh, that were applied elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, then they, they could discern what they wanted to do mm -hmm. in a more appropriate fashion. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would appreciate some feedback on that because it, it's an additional quite a bit of money that mm -hmm. is going to other purposes other than maintenance or um, what they think that they're going to. So it, would this be, for example, like the vehicle license fee that you're referring to? Or no, these are additional gas taxes that are uh, administered by the California Air Resource Board. OK, if they are, well, well, I'll follow up with you later. Thank, Thank you. you. Other questions? Uh, I have one for you, Asha. Yes. Um, this seems contrary to a lot of other uh, information that's been shared when I was working at the US DOT on the NFAC, there was like a running uh, tabulation up on the wall that would tell us when the highway trust fund was going to go bankrupt. So have you looked at that other work and kind of figured out why you're getting a different answer? I'm not sure. I think we might be comparing slightly different things here. So. Obviously, the Federal Highway Trust Fund is based on federal gas tax receipts <laughs> and, and truck weight fees and some other things. Um, and that sort of balance sheet is put against federal commitments. What we were looking at here was the revenues that are raised by the state of California as its, its own entity. So none of this included you know, federal transfers fuel tax money or otherwise, okay. and it also didn't include county-generated revenues, which of course in California is quite okay. substantial. So this was a separate subset, yes. that explains it. Another question, the heavy-duty uh, engine standards, the mm -hmm. EPA has agreed. So it didn't look like the diesel number was as high as I would have anticipated it be, but did you consider uh, increased requirements that are only looked on the books today for the engine standards today? Um, again, I to give you a, like a highly detailed answer, I would probably need to go back and look at this Energy and uh -huh. Information Administration. But as I said, they had 50 different scenarios they looked at with different technologies, inflation rates, and such things. So I think it's likely that that was taken into account. Okay. Um, but again, if you want to let me know. Um, well, I, I would have a question with that. And then mm -hmm. the proposal for our transit operators to go mm -hmm. all uh, electric mm -hmm. would have some impact. Many of them have already gone to a natural gas and are not running on diesel. But it would be interesting, and I think you, you uh, told us that you didn't put all of the goals in there. You put the actual, uh, what we've achieved today, and I think it's 4% on the ZEVs or something, <laughs> some number of penetration. But I think it would be helpful for all of us mm -hmm. to assume that we hit those goals. Mm -hmm. What does it do to our infrastructure and our transportation mm -hmm. funding? Because I think mm -hmm. that's a discussion that we all need to have. So mm -hmm. if we migrate 
our transit to all electric, uh, does that change one of these bands of charts? Mm -hmm. And also uh, to hit our targets with a million uh, ZEVs mm -hmm. and then the other targets that are more aggressive, I think it would be good for all of us to be having uh, that information. So. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a fairly straightforward exercise to just change a few of the inputs into our models to assume much faster penetration of electric vehicles. I can mm -hmm. check with my co-authors, but if that's of interest, maybe I can work with Susan's staff to, to try and get back to you all with that. Um, one other thing to think about um, is you know the penetration of electric vehicles in different parts of our fleet. So our transit operators normally aren't paying fuel taxes and vehicle revenue, registration fees and such because you know they're, they're public entities. So that in and of itself probably wouldn't have a huge impact, but you are absolutely right that you know the vehicles that are privately owned, whether that's heavy vehicles or just you know the personal cars we all may, may use from time to time would, will dramatically change that line. Well, I, th I think for all of us, information is good, so we appreciate the work you've done, and tell Marty thanks, too. Uh, Commissioner Medaffer. Thank you very much. Uh, Asha did a great job on this, and uh, along with Asha, uh, Will Kempton and myself uh, spoke on a panel a couple of weeks ago, and we talked about the future transportation funding, but and the reason why this is important, again, for this commission, and the commission's done such a good job on this, is because of our efforts with the road charge. Uh, that truly is something that we look at to the future. Uh, we talk about electric vehicles. Uh, mm -hmm. We talk about autonomous vehicles. I, m my colleagues on the commission should know one of the recommendations of the uh, Road Charge Technical Advisory Committee is that all autonomous vehicles, all state-owned vehicles, uh, should move into a per-mile fee collection system to get off the gasoline tax, setting an example in the state of California. And I know that'll be going to Chairman Frazier as potential legislation. Uh, but as we see companies like General Motors moving to transportation as a service, the fact that car sales will probably be zero uh, or close to zero 30 years from now or even sooner, uh, there's so many things that that affects from sales tax revenues to cities and counties, the gasoline tax, all of these things. We, I continue to say, we are in a tectonic shift right now, mm -hmm. unlike anything we've ever seen. And I would encourage Asha, working with uh, Director Branson and others, that we continue to look into the future. This commission's done a great job. Garth has been leading this to really look at where the future is taking us. Mm -hmm. It's happening much faster mm -hmm. than anybody ever realizes. And I think we need to be ready for it. Certainly, it's our job to advise the legislature to be ready for it. That's certainly my goal in 2019, is that we start moving quickly now. And I'll leave you with this. Just today, uh, incoming chair, um, uh, Peter DeFazio from Oregon uh, is proposing a national vehicle miles travel pilot program. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's going to per, uh, uh, propose a national VMT pilot that will allow people to opt in and get a rebate off of the gas tax that they may have paid. So taking the lead from California, Oregon certainly has been the leader in this. Uh, this, folks, is happening, and it's happening now. And I'll just add one uh, shared thought with Commissioner Radoffer, which is that I think in addition to the, the technology changing of how we make our vehicles move, um, the move to potentially shared ownership and, and these you know, mm -hmm. TNCs, it, it's, we no longer are charging a mileage fee on us, you know, individuals who have to have accounts and know the rules and pay it, it just becomes a fee that is paid by a corporation. And that corporation is already tracking all of the vehicles and recording all of the trip data. So I think it may very much change the kind of the administrative calculus and also the political calculus as to whether a mileage fee is realistic. And I could even imagine it might first be not voluntary, but mandated on these these you know corporate owned vehicles, possibly. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we will move on to item 19, SB1. Robert. Good afternoon, commissioners. Tab 19 is an information item to provide an update on SB1 activities since our October meeting. 
Important SB1 activities to note, staff has finalized review of Cycle 4 Active Transportation Program applications. The Commission received 554 applications seeking over $2 billion. Staff recommendations will be posted to the Commission's website by December 31st, 2018. Uh, next, staff finalized and sent out the non-infrastructure project benefit forms. Uh, completed forms are due back to staff by December 31st, 2018. And finally, Commission staff initiated discussions with our partners on Cycle 2 competitive programs. We anticipate workshops to begin early 2019. That concludes my update. Okay, this was an information item. Is there any questions? Hearing none, we'll move to item number 20, evaluation of Caltrans effectiveness and reducing deferred maintenance. Chris. Thank you, Chair Inman. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Item 20 is an action item. Senate Bill 1 requires Caltrans to report to the Commission on its progress towards meeting the targets and performance measures established for the Asset Management Plan and requires the Commission to evaluate the effectiveness of Caltrans in reducing deferred maintenance and improving road conditions on the state highway system. The complete asset management plan prepared by Caltrans was approved by the Commission in March of 2018, two years earlier than required by statute. Having an approved asset management plan was a first critical step towards achieving the Senate Bill 1 performance targets. In October of 2018, Caltrans reported on its progress towards meeting the targets established for the state highway system. Commission staff utilized Caltrans assessment towards achieving the annual, annual benchmarks to evaluate the effectiveness of Caltrans through 2017 and 18. Based on these evaluations, Commission staff finds that Caltrans has demonstrated it has made progress in 2017 and 18 towards reducing deferred maintenance and improving conditions on the state highway system. Additionally, Caltrans has established effective management tools and procedures that will pr promote success in meeting the Senate Bill 1 performance targets in the future. Based on these evaluations, Commission staff recommends that the Commission approve the evaluations set forth in Attachment 1 of Tab Item 20. Are there any questions? Okay, we had a motion by Commissioner Gilmetti, a second, I believe, was by Commissioner Arp. Was that? Yeah. No. Yeah. Medaffer, I'm sorry, down there. Not recognizing those voices today. Okay, any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for, oh yes, discussion. Chairman Frazier. Just, I just wanted to segue on, on what he's saying about when we talk about road conditions improving, and that has been dramatic fr from the efforts of Caltrans, but what we have had is a, an increase in fatality rate on our California state highways, in large in part because of the deficient amount of highway patrol officers that we have, and they work in conjunction with Caltrans in doing these projects, to, not only to protect the construction workers and Caltrans employees, but the traveling public. You know, we're, we're, we're about 500 officers down to be even effective. There was 473 officers laid off in 2009 and never restored due to the budget problems that were going on forward. So we've been looking at a, a increasing the budget um, for the Highway Patrol to add 120 officers a year for over the next four years. We had unanimous support in the, both houses. It landed on the governor's desk and it was vetoed. Um, I'm asking the, the commission to engage in this next legislative session to protect not only the Caltrans and, and the construction workers, but also the traveling public based on the additional workload that SB will, re, will bring to the, uh, to the world of tra transportation. So I'm, I'm urging you uh, for your support. Okay. Did you want to respond? <clears throat> Any comments on that? Okay, Manager, Director Riss. Um, we will, I will ask our, legis our staff that handle legislation to work with Assemblymember Frazier in his office uh, following any legislation that may be uh, moving forward and uh, bring that forward to you to consider supporting. Great. Okay, this was an action item. We have a motion on the floor. All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? Motion carries. My note says this would be a wonderful time for a bio break. We're a little behind where we thought we would be, so I'm ask everybody to be back promptly uh, in 10 minutes. So on your mark, get set.